Hey there, I'm Dr. Barbara Woods, and I'm so excited you are back for this episode of the Intergenerational Trauma Therapist Show. And today we're going to be talking about unseen scars, and those are the silent impacts of intergenerational trauma on children and teen in their development. So it's really about the impacts of intergenerational trauma on children and teen, their development, and then how that impacts them as they, they grow older. Um, so we're gonna look at how does unresolved trauma in from past generations manifest in children and teens in today in their behavior and their development, we're also going to look at the neurological and developmental impacts of that intergenerational tra trauma on child development and how we can address them. So I am going to check quickly to make sure this video is streaming into my Facebook group. Um, there's been some changes where um, we can't stream directly into a Facebook group and we've had to find a workaround in order to go live in a Facebook group and hopefully it will pop up pretty soon. If not, I will upload the video and we will go from there. So to answer these questions about the impacts of past trauma and the neurological impacts on children and teens, we're gonna look at the, un the impact of unresolved trauma in past generations, we're going to look at the child developmental impacts and some teen developmental information and strategies to address these impacts as well. I'm going to check again. Okay, I'm going to take a minute here to... figure out there is supposed to be a way to get this to stream but it is not doing it So I will unfortunately have to figure that out later since we are actually live. Um, so the impact of unresolved trauma on past generations, um, it is the groundwork for emotional, behavioral, psychological, and social impacts. This is really where the transmission and the impacts create the next generation that can carry that trauma forward as well. Without healing, it weaves itself into absolutely every aspect of the family, especially their family dynamics, how they relate to each other, their attachment and parenting strategies, and their individual behaviors. So these impacts are created through three main routes of transmission. There's in utero development, where there's a developmental period that's critical for the development of an emotional regulation um, network in the, the brain. And if there's high amounts of stress during that period of time, that the energy goes away from developing that circuit and into more survival and responding to cortisol in the, the bloodstream from the mother. So um, that's the in utero development and there's that critical developmental period there's also the early developmental environment, which there's also critical periods there for um, different impacts and on different circuits that are developing that if there's a high degree of stress, poor attachment, um, separation, all those kinds of things, um, there will be an impact on the development of that circuit that develops after birth. And just the early zero to three is a huge developmental time for, um, for attachment. So that is, it's so critical. Um, and then we also see patterns in, observed in families where we will see that um, generations back, they'll, they'll repeat patterns, but we really don't, we can't say it's genetics. We can't tie it back to any certain event. It's just these repeated patterns that we see in people. 
So I'm going to try one more thing to try to get this to go because it is in my Okay, I just shared it from my professional page, so it'll go into the Facebook group. So if you are in the Facebook group, we are kind of at the beginning of the presentation um, because Facebook is being a little difficult this morning. So how do these impacts on the past generations, how do they manifest? So what we'll see is we'll see mental health difficulties, we'll see anxiety, depression, trauma, um, all of those things, poor coping, we'll see the mental health difficulties, we'll see dysfunctional relationship patterns where sometimes there's families that just they, they have a certain communication style in their family, that's what, what life is about, but it might be a destructive communication style, it might be a lot of yelling, it might be shut down, it might be blaming, all those things that make it very difficult to have healthy relationships and attachments. There also may be a high degree of autonomic reactivity. So we learn how to regulate our nervous system through co-regulation with a parent or caregiver. Um, and if we don't have, if our parents and caregivers are always dysregulated, that's going to impact the development of the child's autonomic reactivity as well. They could be more reactive and have um, significant periods of dysregulation, or they can be just really shut down. So there can also be excessive fear or aggression and anger. And basically why that becomes um, present is because the that's the autonomic reactivity. So that's your fight and flight response. And if people live in those responses, this is what is going to create excessive fear, anger, explosiveness, and that's going to have an impact on relationships, development, and all of that. There can also be shutdown and disconnection. Sometimes families are, they're in survival mode and they don't really, um, they don't really connect. They're just trying to get through and it, just making it through the day is all that we can really ask for them until they get some help and support. So you'll see kind of aloof relationships in a families or you'll see just kind of a lack of connection or a lack of feeling of warmth or care or concern. So the main domains of impact on child and teen development are these are from Vander Kolk and um, a couple other authors that propose the developmental trauma disorder. So it's proposed, it's not an actual diagnosis, but these are the domains that they mentioned. Attachment, biological development, so that has to do with um, muscle tone, um, autoimmune disorders, um, sensory issues, all those kind of the biological development. Affect regulation, so that's the ability to handle emotional dysregulation and manage um, emotions and feelings. Dissociation, so that's that shutdown and checkout kind of response that can kind of bloom or blossom into its own thing that has a really significant impact on the emotional well being of families and children and teens. Um, behavioral control. So it really is a lack thereof. Um, the impacts can cause huge behavioral problems where you'll see aggression, poor boundaries, um, <clears throat> not being able to kind of self-regulate to sit in a seat, but it's actually not ADHD. It's more related to the trauma. <clears throat> There's huge impacts on cognition as well in that um, when the brain is hijacked and is solely concentrated on survival during school, during daily events, your brain is not going to be able to access the higher cortical structures. So that's where you're thinking, planning, judgment, problem solving, reasoning, 
all of that kind of gets shut down in the name of survival. So that's a good thing if there truly is threat. But when it happens too much and a person gets stuck there, that's when it can impact those, those cognitive abilities. And self-concept, the development of negative self thoughts, beliefs, and schemas are developed really between the ages of five to seven. And this is a period where the brain cannot fact check, but it can recognize patterns. So the brain will say, like, mom got mad and yelled at me, I'm a bad kid. And then every experience that they have that could possibly be the explanation that I'm a bad kid will kind of load in there and it'll build this kind of automatic thought process that really has an impact later in life. And when we're looking at intergenerational trauma, there's also self-concept things that can be passed down in families as well, such as the world is a terrible place, you can't trust anybody, you don't talk to anybody, um, that those kinds of things can also be passed down in the family as well. So some more influences on child development. We're going to look at those proposed um, criteria for the developmental trauma disorder. And there's four main criteria. First is that there's some type of trauma. <clears throat> there's either interpersonal victimization. So you yourself have been had an experience where um, it was traumatic or it's a traumatic disruption in the primary attachment. So that is where the intergenerational trauma really hits that because there's usually disruptions in the primary attachment, whether it is um, difficulties just with attachment and the family stays intact or significant difficulties in attachment that end up with a child welfare protection agency kind of separating the children from the parents for their own safety. Um, so those both can be um, ways that that criterion is met. The second criterion, you look for a lot of emotional dysregulation. So that links up into those impacts that we just talked about. You look for somatic dysregulation, which is sensory difficulties and um, difficulties with um, body and space and um, overwhelm with hypersensitivity to sounds or not being able to process those sounds. There can also be a dampened emotional and somatic awareness. So this is where people can get very kind of cut off from, and children, teens, can get very cut off from their emotional experience. They really don't know how they feel. They don't have a lot of access to the depth of their emotions because they, they really don't have the luxury of being able to deal with these because they're too busy kind of trying to shut down to survive. And somatic awareness. So this is where you'll have kids that they can't tell when they're hungry. They can't tell when they're full. They have a lack of sensitivity to pain or they're hypersensitive to pain. So there's some of those, like the body awareness just sometimes isn't there. A impaired ability to label and identify emotions and somatic experiences. So they may have difficulties in relationships because they, they can't identify when somebody's feelings are hurt or when somebody looks scared or when they look happy, they just, they can't identify and label those emotions because they've been so dampened in their experience. The third criterion is related more to um, hypervigilance. So you'll find hypervigilance or dampened attention to threat. And basically this is either the neuroception, faulty neuroception of threat or not even being able to neurocept. Um, the nervous system becomes unable to neurocept danger and they can walk through a war zone and just be like, nothing's happening because they've had to get to that point in order to survive what is happening in their home or in their experience. So there can be an impaired self-protection or boundaries. So these might be 
kids that are really precocious and will sit in the in a waiting area on the stranger's lap and ask if they can go home with them or if they want to play. Um, they don't have that stranger danger and they can't, when they do sense danger, sometimes they kind of shut down and don't respond, which leaves them high risk for further victimization. So that's an area for these kids that we really need to watch out for especially in teenagers, because they're starting to get into and exposed to more high-risk activities. There's also maladaptive coping strategies. So these would be your self-harm, substance abuse, um, relationship kind of addiction, I guess you'd say, and um, using anger to kind of influence and control relationships all of those maladaptive coping strategies that are related to that fight or flight. It can be that non-suicidal self-injury, kind of um, the difficulties with initiating or sustaining goal-directed behavior too. So when you're in a situation of complex developmental trauma, life kind of happens to you and you just get by day by day and you don't feel like you can have an impact or an effect on your environment or your life. So you, you just don't learn how to set goals or initiate behavior. So when they're maybe out in the workforce or in school, they, they don't have any goal-directed behavior. They don't care if they get assignments done. They don't really understand like, why is this even important? Um, because they're just living in the moment, trying to get through and trying to survive. The fourth criterion is really related to um, kind of how they see themselves and how they relate to other people. So the first thing you look for is negative self-beliefs and um, self-loathing because they sometimes commonly have thoughts that I'm damaged goods, nobody loves me, um, the world is a terrible place, I'll never be safe. So we look for those, that self-loathing where they're angry or they, they're very negative towards themselves because they've gotten all these messages that, that they're not going to be cared for. And if you're not cared for, it's probably the brain interprets that, that you've done something wrong or you're a bad person, even though that's not true. So we want to look for those negative self-beliefs and that self-loathing. We want to look at attachment insecurity or disorganization. Whenever you see disorganized attachment, that's a cue to start looking at intergenerational trauma because that is highly likely to be in, in the background if you're working with disorganized attachment. Also high sensitivity to betrayal in relationships. So this is um, when kids feel like their friends are talking about them or they've done something against them, they're very sensitive to people letting them down because they can't trust people um, due to the experiences that they've had. There's behavioral reactivity, both verbal and physically aggressive. So you may see a child that quickly responds physically and attacks when everything was good and everybody was playing for some reason, that one child's nervous system may detect threat and react physically. Or they may use verbal strategies to hurt other people to kind of protect themselves. Poor psychological boundaries. So you'll kind of see a variation of they'll either be really intrusive and not know when they should kind of pull themselves back or when they're kind of violating space or emotional um, well-being of another person, or they may be really disconnected and don't even connect with other people because they're just, they're so shut down. And there's typically impaired empathy in relationships, so they won't be able to take the perspective of another person in a situation and kind of understand how they might be thinking or feeling. That goes back to their difficulties with emotion regulation and recognizing emotions. So a special note about teen development, um, between the ages of 12 to 25, there's a huge rapid burst of brain development. And this is a time where we can harness this, 
and have really good outcomes, or it's a time of really high vulnerability. So what's happening during this stage, and there are several critical developmental periods, but this is going to help a lot of people understand like what is happening with teenagers and why do we see some of the behavior that we see. So one of the first thing that's happening at around age 12 is that unused pathways in the brain are going to get pruned back. So I always explain this like it's like a forest floor with a bunch of brush laid down. And there's some kind of paths that have been used more, but it's just it's really dense brush and it's kind of difficult to get th through. And these may be um, if you've had a lot of messages that you're a good person, you're loved, the world is a safe place, that pruning is going to take away everything else. If you haven't had those messages, if you've always felt like you're on the edge of a peer group or you're not accepted by your peers, you feel like you're not loved at home, then that those I'm a good person, people love me is going to be pruned away and whatever else has been laid down is going to ignite. So that's the other part of the development at this period is the pathways that have been used and reinforced from zero to 12 end up just accelerating. So if this is a, if there's a teen that during childhood maybe was on the, the outside of a peer group, was never really accepted, had a rough life at home, didn't have really good experiences. When they turn about 12, you're going to see, I'm not safe. Um, I'm not lovable. I'm damaged. You're going to see kind of a shift in that, that person um, at around 12, and it'll accelerate through adolescence if there's not intervention. So this is the beautiful strength of harnessing this, the power of the brain. But the flip side is that extreme vulnerability, because if the negative beliefs about themselves have been laid down, that's what's going to accelerate. So they can be very prone to mental health difficulties, and it's due to that pruning, pruning and acceleration of growth. So how you'll see this is we all know a child or teen who's kind of quiet, reserved, kind of in the, in the shadows, not really um, on the edge of that peer group, had a tough time at home. Um, all of a sudden, when they hit about 12 or 13, they can just totally kind of flip and become countercultural or they can start engaging in really negative behavior and getting in a lot of behavioral trouble or they can become kind of antisocial and get in legal trouble even. Um, so this is a period where if they've been marginalized in their earlier development, you may see this very sudden negative shift. And that's because all that brush of I'm loved, the world's a good place, people care about me has been cut away and people don't care, the world's a terrible place, I'm going to get what I need, that accelerates. So most parents, when this happens, they'll have kind of a shocking experience where all of a sudden their teen kind of exerts themselves or takes on something about fashion or politics or something that is totally unexpected. And they have a moment where they're like, who is that? That's not my kid. Because this is where that shift, that's how you know that shift has taken place and they're starting to learn to separate from parents. And that's the developmental task at this stage. They need to learn to be independent from parents, but they need to stay connected because they need them more than ever during their teen years. So teens are in that developmental stage that requires that separation from caregivers. And navigating this is really difficult for teens, regardless of intergenerational trauma. It can be even more complicated when there's been complicated attachment histories. So what can happen is you can have kind of a, because they're dependent on their parents, they'll be close, they'll be, um, they'll do what they say, they'll kind of follow along, they won't create any distress or discomfort in the family or the house or and or they may have some behavioral problems, but when they get to this point where they're de developmentally tasked with separating, 
They may take a hard right from any parental influence and the only way they feel like they can separate is through some kind of extreme behavior. So you'll see this in engaging in illegal activities, drug use, um, running away, all those high risk activities because they're taking a hard right from that parental influence. At the same time, they're relying on peer relationships and um, rejecting adults. So if they're in a social group that is sports oriented and supportive, drug and alcohol free, they, their separation may be much smoother than a, a child or a teen who has been in a peer group that has more difficulties and has more behavioral acting out. So because of the vulnerability and these dormant or unconscious beliefs that develop, there's huge behavioral changes at this period of time when there's intergenerational trauma and there's can be really high risk behavior. So interventions that we can use to support the children and their development and teens and their development um, this is why the framework of the intergenerational trauma program and the intergenerational resilience method includes child development in there because we have to address that autonomic regulation and the attachment to decrease the current developmental impact. So the, the developmental impacts are what is going to carry intergenerational trauma to the next generation. So if we can shift the parents' generation and minimize the impacts, shift the child's generation and stop the developmental impacts, arrest them or treat them, the next generation has much less impacts or possibly very minimal to none. So now we're gonna look at interventions that lessen the current impacts um, that are already present. So trauma therapy, um, in a framework that's consistent between the parent and the child or teen, so they have the same language, same understanding of behavior, um, is really important because you want to have that continuity between generations. And it becomes easier for the parent to understand what's happening with the child or teen so they can quickly identify through their own work on themselves with their therapist. They can quickly identify that, um, oh, they're they're dysregulated, they're not angry, they don't hate me, this is a fight response. And this is how I'm gonna anchor in my window of tolerance or my social engagement system, and I'm gonna co-regulate them to help them calm down. Um, so that trauma therapy should be in a framework that's consistent across generations, or you'll end up with the child maybe learning about um, age-appropriate polyvagal interventions, if the parent is learning maybe CBT, they're not gonna, there's not going to be this flow where there's a, kind of an automatic understanding of behavior based on the treatment that the parent is going through and what the, the child is going through as well. Secondary therapy goals and referrals to address these developmental impacts can include OT referrals for the sensory impacts. These are really important because trauma is really a sensory experience. And if we're not equipped to deal with that, or if it's a level beyond our scope of practice, we need to get an OT involved so that they can really help master those sensory impacts and help them um, manage and kind of get around those. We wanna look at self-esteem communication, social skills, their relationships, especially relationships um, that are like romantic, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner type things, um, because this is where they're going to move away from parents. And sometimes they latch onto a relationship. And if they don't have the relationship skills, they can just repeat this pattern. We want them to learn stress resilience and regulation, emotion regulation, behavior regulation, um, conflict resolution and problem solving, 
mindfulness, self-compassion, empathy, and optimism so that they have a different emotional approach to life and they're much more kind of centered or have a wider window of tolerance. We want them to have a, a strong identity development to know who they are in the context of the world and their peer group and their family. Um, and we also want them to have a sense of belonging. That sense of belonging is so important for teens um, because that's part of their identity development at that stage. We want to support any kind of academic goals or gains or things that they need support with. And we also might want to look at body image, self-care, and physical health, because sometimes there's a pattern of huge neglect of the self because they're just busy surviving, so they don't learn how to take care of themselves. So now we are going to go into a new little segment in the show that I think you will quite like. We're going to look at where you might get stuck. So I love that video because it reminds me of the idea of teaching parents about the shark music, either Daniel Siegel or Circle of Security. I've heard that from both of them, that when parents get dysregulated, it's almost like they'll hear shark music and they'll start to, oh, I'm going to get that kid or something. They'll It'll shift. That's how they can recognize that there's a shift in their level of dysregulation or level of regulation. So for us as therapists, we can experience that too when we have some questions that we don't know what's happening. So in one of the first areas that I get, the main question I get regarding the development is that like with neuroplasticity, what's the age range that's most crucial for intervening in the cycle of intergenerational trauma? And why is that the most important point of development? My answer is that intervention is important at any and all ages, but for very different reasons. And there are periods of greater neuroplasticity, but we're always able to make those connections as long as our brains are healthy and there's not some kind of organic process that would prevent that. So one of the times is that in utero, when those brain circuits are developing, for the motion regulation and relational attachment based, um, based activities. So that would just, the interventions for that would be making sure that the, the mother has adequate supports, that they're safe, um, that they have the, the things that they need to have a lower stress. They're not involved in domestic violence, that kind of thing to really decrease the stress on the mother to create a better in utero environment for the child. Zero to 12, this is where we can do interventions to prevent the impacts from happening. So if we can intervene between zero and 12, address intergenerational trauma, those impacts are less likely to happen later on in like your biological development, attachment, um, cognitive, all of those, those areas of difficulty. So that's zero to 12, 12 to 25, we can, the impacts are probably already there. So what we want to do is we want to either mitigate and stop them from progressing or kind of arresting these impacts and get back on track developmentally as much as possible. Now, sometimes that due to the intensity of certain experiences, sometimes we may not be able to eliminate the impacts, but if we help the person get around those impacts or develop other strategies, then it kind of offsets and stops that transmission. After 25, our brains were still capable of neuroplasticity, but it's not a critical period, so it's not going to be as easy as it is, not that it's easy, but it won't be as efficient as it is 0 to 12 or 12 to 25. But it's still possible to change some of those, those impacts and arrest those, those things from being transmitted. And when we arrest them in the child or teen generation, 
they have a different path. And when they have children or when they're involved in children's lives, they won't pass on the intergenerational impact. So this is really where we're intervening to stop the transmission to the next generation and to bring the child or teen generation that healing. <clears throat> the next question I get that is um, kind of where therapists can get stuck is how do we identify signs of intergenerational trauma in children and teens, especially when they don't verbalize their feelings or you may not know what's happening in the family? So how I do that is I continually observe the impacts on development that we've talked about. So I look for difficulties in att att attachment, behavioral development, um, biological development, how they handle their emotions, um, if they're experiencing high levels of dissociation, like the impact on their education and cognition, and their self-concept. So this, the hard thing about this is we're not doing this to diagnose. So we're not doing this to say yes or no, this person has intergenerational trauma at mild, moderate, or severe levels. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're forming more hypotheses about what might be happening in this child or teen's life. So we may not have direct evidence initially. We may not know anything about the child's background or their family, um, but these developmental impacts can lead to further assessment of a family history uh, if the family's available or if, and if they're willing to do that. So it's important to look at this as this is kind of hypothesis development and kind of detecting what you're seeing. It's not a strong categorization of yes or no or diagnostic. Okay, so I am going to go in my group. I'm gonna see if there's any comments that I can answer right now. Okay. All right. So in closing, this big concept of attending to child development in the context of intergenerational trauma, it is critical for arresting and preventing the transmission of intergenerational trauma to the next generation. Um, and it's so impactful on child development. It can actually be a little bit tricky to identify because it gets woven into the fabric of the family. So it's just woven into their daily lives and it gets woven into the child's development. So it might, people might think, well, they're just, their whole family acts out like that. So that's the reason this child is acting out as well. Um, but really when you look back, there's impacts that these are, that are causing this type of behavior. And these impacts are the vehicle of transmission to the unborn, the next generation. So that's why it becomes so important to, to intervene and make sure we get that child development back online or we stop the impacts at a level that, that they're at currently. So this is the third pillar of the intergenerational resilience method and it's critical for stopping that transmission to the next generation. There's a high degree of neuroplasticity at this time that's critical to address these developmental impacts. Um, and that's why it's the third, third pillar of the intergenerational resilience method. So we start with calming the family nervous system, taking the heat out of their interactions or creating more flexibility in, their, in the family system. We wanna increase earn secure attachment. We support child development and then we build connection um, and family resilience. So next week, we will be looking at how we build that connection and family resilience after we've addressed all these other impacts in the autonomic regulation, attachment, and development. So I hope you have a beautiful day, and I'll see you next weekend.